Welcome to another installment of the Geotechnical Graduate Seminar. Uh, not much for housekeeping today. I just wanted to reiterate that these seminars are a great opportunity for students to present their work. Currently, we only have one student signed up to present in the new year, and obviously we need more. Please consider and contact either myself or Vivian if you're interested to present. Today, we have a presentation by my friend Justin Park on predicting the annular pressure created during horizontal directional drilling operations. Justin recently completed his MSc program here at the University of Alberta and was roped into continuing to do a PhD under Dr. Ali Reza Bayat in the Consortium for Engineered Trenchless Technologies group. His research is focused on the horizontal directional drilling borehole stability. Please join me in welcoming Justin. Hello, thank you for participating in my presentation today. My name is Inshik and I'm a PhD student in CETT, which stands for the Consortium for Engineered Trenchless Technologies. And I am under supervision of Dr. Ali Bayat. And today I'm going to talk about the framework for field-based annular pressure prediction in horizontal directional drilling. Today's presentation, I will start with the background information and problem statement, and then I'll move on to methodology for this research and results and discussions. And finally, I will mention about the conclusions and future works. For the background information, horizontal directional drilling is referred as HDD. It is a hard trenchless technique used for the installation of utility and infrastructure, making the underground tunnel as a bore path. And it is used to avoid the superficial obstacles such as river, railways, and highways. And it is useful for the situations where the traditional open cut method is, is not feasible. According to the well-known contractor called Crossing Company, this technique can be varied from the two inches to 60 inches diameters. And lengthwise, it can be varied from 50 meters to 3,000 meters. So it can be said it's, it's applied for the wide variation. During the HDD, a borehole is drilled to create an insulation path for the various utility and infrastructures. Drilling must should be filled up in the borehole to maintain the stability and the removal of the cutting and the cooling of the drilling bits and etc. As you can see, the drilling mud pressure has to be applied toward the wall of the bore. And as the drilling operation proceeds further from the entry point, requirements for the pressure in drilling mud should be increased. As you can see, this is the profile for the drill path. And this can be treated as the cross section for this bore path. As the drilling proceeds further from the entry point, the pressure amount has to be increased. And if this increase in the pressure exceeds the capacity of the surrounding soil, then the HDD bore will fail and the drilling fluid will escape from the, the borehole and the fluid may reach up to the surface. And if this phenomenon is called a hydrofracture, and if this hydrofracture happens in the urban area, you can see it leaves the damage to the surface. And same thing can happen to the railways and the highways, then it will cause delay for the traffic in the corridors. And if this drilling mud enters to the water body, it can cause a lot of concerns and this is the example for the wetlands. The drilling mud went into the water body and contaminated the water. And the mediation is very difficult to achieve. And sometimes it might not be possible to bring it back to the original condition. So it is very important to avoid such environmental concern. And the worst thing is if the pressure cannot be maintained inside the borehole, and the HDD operation cannot be continued until the pressure is regained. So the trenchless designers try to avoid the hydrofracture and they try something called the inadvertent return assessment. They simply call it IR assessment. During the IR assessment, they check to make sure the surrounding soil is strong enough to contain the pressure of the drilling mud during the HDD operation. And during the IR assessment, it requires two components to be compared, which are the minimum mud pressure of the drilling mud 
and the maximum allowable pressure of the surrounding soil media. And this maximum allowable pressure is related to my research. This is the example for the IR assessment. Y-axis represents the pressure of the green mud, and the X-axis represents the length of the bore path. So this example starts by drilling from the right side, advances toward the left side. This orange line represents the minimum amount of pressure, and the blue line represents the maximum amount of pressure. So the whole point is to keep this minimum amount of pressure under the maximum amount of pressure. However, this first 75 meter, you can see the minimum amount of pressure is greater than the maximum amount of pressure, which may lead into the hydro fracture. So it is important to estimate the maximum allowable pressure accurately in order to avoid the hyperfracture. There are multiple ways to estimate the maximum allowable pressure, which are the analytical method, numerical method, empirical method, and experimental method. And my research focuses on the analytical method. For the analytical solution of the maximum allowable pressure, they use the cavity expansion theories, and this is the typical setup. So the whole idea is to have the plastic zone with the plastic behavior kept surrounded by the elastic zone, which follows the theory of linear elasticity. And by solving the radial equilibrium equation, we can calculate the maximum allowable pressure of the, of the HCB bore. And here are the examples of the noticeable analytical methods, which are the Delft method, UN Hulsby's method, Queen's method, and the rule of thumb method. The Elfton method is developed by the Luger and her garden in 1988. This is the generally accepted and most commonly used method. And you can see this is the equation for it. And, and here are the input parameters for the Delft method. UN Hoosby's method was developed by UN Hoosby in 1991. This was developed for the latent cohesionless soils. And it is not often used among the industry because it has the long procedure and it contains a serious expansion term which a lot of users find it difficult to code into spreadsheets. As you can see it has quite a lot to do the program in there. And Quinn's method was developed by CI and Moore in 2006 and this is a method gaining popularity recently especially for the undrained purely cohesive place this is gaining a lot of popularity. And the rule of thumb method is a rough estimator used by the contractors sometimes. And it only considers the total overburden stress into the accounts, neglecting the soil strength. So it results extremely conservative value in which this value is not feasible to work with for a lot of cases. And this 22 just simply is representing the 22 kilonewton per kilometer of soil. So you can tell this is very, very rough estimator. And for my research among these four, I decided to focus on the Delft method as it is being the most used and I'm trying to find the practical application to estimate the maximum allowable pressure. So the, for the problem statement, I figured it out. The estimation of Pmax using the Delft method and the P hydrofracture, which is the measured hydrofracture pressure, they are not finding good agreements. And this is the, another representation of the, the estimations done by the other researchers. Y axis represents the P max estimated with the Delft method by these researchers. The X axis represents the P hydrofracture, which is the measured measurements from the hydrofracture pressures. So you can see the P max is much greater than the P hydrofracture as these coefficients are mostly greater than one. And the R square for these correlations were found lower than 0 0.35, so which is significantly low. And it can be concluded that the method overestimates the P max with low accuracy. Since the PMX is not equal to P hydrofracture, there were these questions if they can find the linear relationship 
between the P-max and the P-hydro factor. And at this moment, it seems to be pretty difficult because the prediction has the very low accuracy as well. So my question was, what is causing such low accuracy in the estimation of P-max? So for the methodology, I was coming up with the possible reasons for such inaccuracy of the alpha method. First is the delta method does not represent the cavity expansion accurately. And second one was delta method may be accurate, however, its input parameters might not be accurate. And third one was that measurements of the hydrofracture pressure used for comparisons may not be accurate. So I was questioning why that they would not be accurate for the each cases. So for the first one, why the delta method might not be accurate? This is the setup as presented before. Because the Luger and her garden assume the plastic zone may reach up to the ground surface, which might not be the case for all the time. Let's say for the HDD bore was, was created in the greater depth compared to those shallow ones. It is unlikely to have the plastic zone to fail reaching all the way up to the surface because the confinement pressure is very high and it's unlikely to have the, this plastic behavior reach all the way up to the surface. And there's a lot of controversy going on in the size of the plastic zone in the research. Van Bressa and her garden said the, the size of plastic zone, which they denoted as RPMX, should be the two thirds of the depth of the cover for the sand and the half for the clays. And Stahili et al. said the plastic zone may be two to three times of the diameter of the initial bore rate, bore diameter. And the NEN is the standard for the Netherlands. And this is a little bit more advanced than the other methods, but this, this epsilon G max is the maximum allowable strain which they set it up as 5%, it seems like a quite large assumption. And Rostami et al. and Gores et al. Rostami and Gores et al. found the, the RP max has to be much smaller than the H, but they did not find apparent correlation between two. This RP max definition is the most common and it is accepted by USAC. The second one is gaining popularity and it recently was approved by the USAC. This third one, the NEN is the standard in the Netherlands. So while they are being accepted, but since they are very different from each other, it is pretty difficult to decide which RP max to be used at this moment. And the third question was, why are the measurements of the hydrofracture pressure unreliable? Because some laboratory data was provided by Poulin Elwood and Sia. These are the relatively small scale compared to the real HDD because these tests were two meter by two meter by two meter, which is much smaller than the real HDD. And because these were such small scale, these laboratory tests were significantly affected by the wall effect uh, around the test cells. And as I said, the depth of cover was equal or less than two meters which is much, much shallower than the real HDD. And even though some field data were provided by Poulin and Sahili and all, there's only very limited data available. So it was difficult to make a validation using such small amounts of data. And conducting additional laboratory experiment was not my current research scope. So I left this behind and I decided to improve in the other approach. Second one was the accuracy with the input parameters of DELF method. So for the DELF method, there are many input parameters as presented in here. You stand for the initial input in situ core pressure, which is assumed to be hydrostatic pressure. And the initial effective stress, we assume it as equal to the or as the effective overall interest. And the R naught is the initial radius of the bore, which is selected by the designer. RB max is ambiguous, but it somewhat relates to the H. So this friction angle 
propagation and the shear modulus are the geotechnical parameters to be determined. And then it brings the question why the determination of geotechnical parameters is challenging. It's because most of the practitioners in trenchless engineering industry do not have background in geotechnical engineering. A lot of the pipeline engineering designers are from either mechanical engineering or drilling contractors with many years of experiences. For some projects, geotechnical parameters are provided by geotechnical engineers, but some are not. And with the given borehole loss and the end value, the trenchless engineers try to make their own approximations. And even though the geotechnical parameters are given by the, determined by the geotechnical engineers, it was found that most of the projects were based on the SPT. And we all learned from the site investigation course, the SPT results are not very reliable to predict the geotechnical parameters. I saw very few CPT was used for some cases, but this was very rare. And it was very, very rare to see the other other direct measurements was done for the estimation of PMS using the pressure meter test, magnetometer test, triaxial test, direction tests, and etc. Almost none was found for estimation for the PMAX. Stand, SPT stands for the standard penetration test. We all know this test very well, and I think a lot of you guys have more experience on this test method compared to me. And this is a typical setup for the SPT. And they have a this split spoon sampler attached to the drilling rod, and they use the 140 pound hammer to be dropped from the 30 inch above. And the split spoon sampler has to penetrate 12 inches and to, to drive in such that how many times it's required for the hammer to be blown. That is denoted as n value, and this n value is used as an estimator of many soil properties. And this is the open split spoon sampler. This is the photo, and as you can see, the sample can be collected at the same time, and uh, it can be logged, so additional information can be retained. And the question comes, why it's challenging to determine the geotechnical parameters with SPT? And we can take a look at these correlations. This is the one between the friction angle and the end value. This is the one between the undrained shear strength and the end value. This is between the modulus of the elasticity and the end value. As you can see, that's why the variation and such great variability existing between the geotechnical parameters and the end value. And it makes practitioners to make a lot of judgments. And it can be really difficult for the one who doesn't have expertise. And it gets worse in some cases. So this is the first case. Geotechnical or geological engineer do the site investigation and obtain the end value and borehole loss. And they estimate the geotechnical parameters. And it's given to the trench last engineer without background in the geotech. They use these parameters and substitute them into the valve method to obtain the PMAX. And this case is less problematic. It's not too bad compared to this case, case two. Geotechnical engineer, do the site investigation, give the end value and borehole loss to the trenchless engineer without background. And trenchless engineer estimate the geotechnical parameters based on those given information. And they substitute these values into the DELF method and estimate the PMAX. And this estimation can cause significant error because they do not have idea how they're estimating. So I was thinking if this information given from geotechnical engineers, if the trenchless engineers have a method to estimate the PMAX, a direct SPT method to estimate the PMAX, then it could be helpful reducing such error. So motivation for the SPT-based method was I wanted to see how the estimation of PMAX can be improved by establishing a guideline for determination of geotechnical parameters. And it, the whole purpose was to reduce the subjectivity from unsystematic procedures. And at this point, the rest of the preference of the practitioners among the HD was conserved. My focus was on to 
determination of geotechnical parameters. So all the rest were conserved. So the Delft method was conserved, and the definition of the plastic zone was also conserved for the most popular one, which was which was found by the Van Brusel and her garden. So here is the SPT-based method. Before developing the, the method for the determination of input parameters, I wanted to look at how they differentiate the soil and the HDD industry for this method. So the sand and gravel, which has the coarse grains, it generally has the high permeability compared to the fine grain soil, such as the thin clay, which is generally remaining Undrained condition for such short term period. So, so, so for the drain soil model, it is which is typically cohesionless soil. It is assumed that cohesion is nearly zero, and for the undrained soil, the it is likely to have the the soil to be having no friction mobilized between the particles. So it is assumed to have a friction angle to be near zero. By applying these conditions for the each conditions, a lot of things can be cancelled out. And this C, the cohesion can be replaced for the, as the undrained shear strength for the undrained condition for the fine grain soil. And this is the final form for the simplified version. And for the drain soil model, the friction angle and shear modulus is required. And for undrained soil model, the undrained shear strength is required. For the determination of friction angle for the drain flow model, I looked at the multiple correlations which varied by the different effective stress because the SPT is affected by the overburden stress for the drain flow model. And I wanted to select the reasonably conservative model, not too conservative, but not too overestimating as well. So the, the assumption for the PMS can be reasonable as well. So for the sandy soil, this one was selected, and for the coarse grain soil with the gravel, different one was selected. And for determination of shear modulus, there were two different methods considered, which was using the linear elasticity between the modulus of elasticity and the Poisson ratio. And another one was using the GMAX from geophysical surveys and the backbone curve. So this is the equation for the backbone curve. There are many backbone curve equations available in the literatures, but I just chose the simple one, which was, which was originally developed. And this backbone curve is in the assumption where the stiffness of soil reduces as the soil is deformed further. So this G max is obtained from the geophysical survey where the soil is undeformed and the G will be reduced as the soil deforms further. So the stiffness will become lower. And there was no direct correlation available between the N value and the Poisson ratio. But I could see if there were some typical values available between the relative density distribution of the soil and the Poisson ratio values. I could not see a very clear trend, but I could kind of see when the soil is very loose, the Poisson ratio values are very small. Compared to when the soil is coming denser, then the Poisson ratio values were greater. So only for the usage for this method, I created a very rough estimate model for the Poisson ratio for the end value. So I chose a simple equation for such prediction, but it is not really suggested for using any other purposes because it is just a rough estimator based on the typical values. And this is the correlation between the modulus of elasticity and the end value. So, and it's also shown with the typical values available from the literature. So, ones are the one from the PMT modulus and the DMT modulus. I was thinking the PMT is a good application for, for the hydrofracture because the failure mechanism seems to be quite similar. And this is another one which is coming with uh, results from the geophysical surveys and the uh, assumption of the shear strength. 
and I could find there's some reasonable agreement between these two different methods for the modulus of elasticity and uh, Gmax. So here were the selected correlation for different type of soil for the sand and gravel and sand and silt, silty sand and fine sand. So the different correlations were chosen. And for the determination of undrained shear strength, this is the toughest part because we all know fine grain soil mechanism is not as simple to determine with the end value. But I was thinking still, it has some value because if the end value is greater, it is likely to have the undrained shear strength to be higher. So I decided to take it as a rough estimator. And, but the thing is, we can see there's a great variability between the correlations. So I wanted to see how it comes for the envelope. This is the maximum envelope, minimum envelope, and the average envelope. And interestingly, I could see this average envelope is very similar to the one found by the Karzage in 1996. And I had informal discussion with a few geotechnical engineers, and they said they sometimes use this as a conservative rough estimator for their projects for the preliminary design. So I was thinking this correlation can be used for some value, but if a designer knows more about that soil, then they can also choose the different correlation as well. By taking all the correlations determined into account, so the algorithm in flowchart could be created for the SPD-based method. So we start with the correction for the N60, and it can be distinguished by the type of soil. And I included some limitation for the SPT, such as when it's too shallow, the SPT result is not applicable. And also when the N value is too low, then it's not applicable for the SPT, but it's suggested to use the gain shear test results instead. So following this algorithm, a designer can estimate the Pmax using the end value. And I wanted to see how the result comes with the SPT based method. So I saw I made some assumption for the drain flow model and the undrained flow model and set the ground level to be up to the surface. And I was assuming the SPT was done by the safety hammer. And here are the examples of the calculation. So these are the y-axis representing the normalized Pmax with the over effective overburden pressure, and the x-axis represents the hand value. And each of them are with the different initial bore radius, which is the 4-inch, 6-inch, the 8-inch, and these are the drain flow models. And this is the one for the undrain flow model, which undrain flow model was independent from the radius of the borehole. So as you can see, linear relationship was found for the undrained soil model compared to non-linear relationship was found from the drain soil model. And another interesting thing was the Pmax estimated with the drain soil model showed much higher Pmax compared to the ones from the undrained soil model. So here is the validation of the SPT based method. I used the, the P hydrofracture from the literature and I could see it has improved its accuracy in terms of R square and and the, and the coefficient so ratio between the P mass and the P hydro factor was about 1.8552. And I plotted this this into the comparison I showed you before and as you can see kind of shows closer lining up of the data. And so it can be found the SPT based method improved the accuracy of the Pmax. And when I removed the two outliers, R square of the SPT based method could be increased from the 0 0.5264 to 0 0.8644, which is becoming much stronger. And to avoid any over prediction of Pmax with SPT based method, it is suggested to divide by a factor of at least 2.0. So this was the first part for my research for the MSc program.
and is now is presenting the second part of the MSc research. So after I developed the SPT based method, I went back to the I went back to the possible reasons for the inaccuracy profile method again. So the first one was Delft method is not representing the correct for the cavity expansion for the HTTP four. Second one was for the input parameter not being accurate. And third one being the measurement not being accurate. So for the second one, it was improved by the SPT based method. Third one was not in my agenda yet. And the first one was I was I wasn't going to develop a new cavity expansion theory because the Delft method has the value. It is representing reasonable phenomenon for the HTT4, and I was thinking it is more problematic with the how people are applying it. So I was thinking how we can improve the application of health method. So it's not like industry did not do anything about the improvement. They did something for the making the concept for the factor of safety for the application of health method. So the first approach was to reduce the size of the plastic zone. When the RP max become lower, they could see the P max become lower as well. Another approach was dividing the P max by additional factor to estimate it close to the P hydro fracture. So my question was, is this appropriate to use the term factor of safety for these cases? Because factor of safety comes from when they want to get the allowable bearing capacity, they divide some factor, which is dividing the ultimate bearing capacity. So I was thinking, we're not even getting the ultimate bearing capacity correctly. So these approaches, what they did before, is more like a correction factors. So for, for the industry, they prepared the several factor depth methods, which this one I showed you before, they typically use the 2.0 as the correction factor. And for this one, they use the 1.5. And for this one, they don't use a single value, but they use the different numbers for the each parameters for the inputs. And as I said, these are more of a correction factors. So I was thinking, it is important to redefine the factor of safety correctly for this estimation of Pmax. So the Pmax estimated with the Delft method can have the correction factor applied to have the Pmax become very similar to the P hydro fracture. And then they can apply another factor to estimate the P allowable, which is suitable for the design. And I was thinking if we have a, an appropriate a proper fact framework for the facts of safety, it will be much beneficial. And my question was how to correct the PMAS to the P hydro fracture, which is using the correction factor. And, and I was seeing the current situation is even though the SPT based method improved the estimation of PMAX, the R square only remained at 0 0.52, which is not really satisfactory. Even though our liars were removed, our square only was 0 0.86. So it was still possible to cause error for the estimation. This means maybe a single value for the correction factor may not be capable of handling all the HDD different type, different HDD con or conditions. So I was thinking maybe the correction factors are affected by the variation of some variables of the Delft method. And I looked into the Delft method again, and I could see the P mass is a function of variables. And these each variables could be defined into in terms of different inputs. But I could see there are some common inputs which can be simplified. And this R0 was found to be insensitive from the results of the SPT based method. And most of the definitions of RPMX were function of the depth or the end value. So when I combine all the information, I could see Pmax is somewhat function of depth and the end value. And 
So I wanted to see how the Pmax and the fraction factors are affected by the variation of these two input variables. And the best way to find the correction factor was by collecting the field measurement data, which is the p hydro fracture, for all different HDD bore conditions and making comparison with the Pmax. However, as mentioned previously, field measurements provided in the literature were extremely limited. And even those limited data was, most of them were from the shallow bores, which makes sense because when the borehole is shallower, it is more likely to have a fail with the hydro fracture. So since the measurement data was not available, I was thinking we can probably use the factored version of the delta method for now because these ones are also kind of approved by the HDD industry over the years. So I, I decided to use the uh, factor delt method with the RPMAX definition and uh, additional correctional factor. And these methods do not really, I do not find they have good theoretical explanation about the size of the plastic zone, but since they are approved by the industry, to resolve the conservative estimation of PMAX. So I was thinking it's a worthy try. And, and because it has not been proven which one is better than the other one, so I decided to consider all of them. And for the input geotechnical parameters, I adopted the SPT-based method, which I created. So for the factor adult method, here are the ones I showed you previously. So it was going to be the comparison between these three. So I was questioning how and which one to be selected. So I made assumption for a few conditions, which is the 10 meter depth, 30 meter depth, and 100 meter depth, and the SPTM value varying from 10, 30, and the 50. And here's a comparison, y-axis for the Pmax and x-axis for the M value. So this is the three different models and uh, it's at the 10 meter depth, this one at the 30 meter depth, and this one at the 100 meter depth. So I could find none of them is absolutely conservative for all different conditions, but it's it's keep changing which one is more conservative. At some point, the one is conservative, most conservative, at some point it becomes the least conservative. And I also wanted to make comparison with the UN host phase method. So I made a comparison with the three methods and this UN host phase method as well in terms of the P max and the RP max. So that was done for three different conditions as well for the different depth. And, and I could see there is no method absolutely more conservative than the other ones for all different conditions in terms of depth and that sort of strength. And UN whose piece model was actually resulting quite close to the NEM method. And the combination of, therefore, the combination of all three factor methods would be considered for development for the framework for the factor of safety. Since we have a lot of information, could I decided to organize a little bit. So for the factor of safety for HDD, we're questioning what we have to consider. So the first thing is how close to the surface the borehole is and how strong the surrounding soil is. And then what is the like, what is the consequence of the failure? This is related to the risk. So I was thinking the facts of safety would relate to the depth, which is H, so a strength, which is the end value, and the risk-based factor, which comes from the risk assessment. And this is the example diagram for the proposed concept for the factor of safety framework. So it's having the Pmax estimated with the delta method with the RPMAX as the depth of cover. And then it gets uh, this factor of safety framework generating a proper factor for, for the corresponding soil condition and the depth and the risk factor and can, and can result the Pmax which is suitable for the final design. And these intervals were chosen roughly and it was based on the 
definition, relative density, description of the pack and law, and this pen was chosen between the borderline between the loose and the medium soil. And this 30 was chosen for the borderline between the medium and dense. And this interval was chosen for the that was even more rough assumption because typically when the when the bore is less than 10 meter depth, they say it's a very shallow bore. And when it's greater than 30 or 100 meter, they consider that as a deep bore. So these were selected in such manner, but for when there is more data available, then these values can be changed for, for the further proper analysis. And it's similar with these risk-based factors. These are just selected for randomly for, I just wanted to show the concept, but filling up the table is the, the one I have to do in the further research. So how I wanted it to work is something like this. So this this factor of safety framework is supposed to create a factor of safety for corresponding for the condition of the HDB board. So this first component is supposed to relate the depth and the soil strength. And the second component is supposed to take care of the risk-based factor. So this first first component can bring a factor and the second one as well. So for example, don't don't put too much meaning into these values yet. So let's say the HDD board was at 20 meter depth and the end value found was 20 for that situation. And let's say that HDD was happening in a high risk environment. And then we can obtain the factor of safety as, so when we apply 20 for the depth and 20 for the end value, we can grab this 2.39 and for the high risk, which we can obtain this 1.5 and we can get a factor of safety. Then when we want to calculate the PMS for the final design, we can divide that value with the PMS obtained from the delta method with the RP max as H. And then we're able to calculate the PMS for the final design. And how to find these correction factors was a question for the first components was the P max with the RP max as H and the no additional factor divided by the P hydro factor, which is the measurements from the field. But this value is not available at this moment. So I decided to grab the P max from the factor itself method for now, which I showed you the three factor methods. And these were the examples. I could get. That was the, for the first one, second one, and third one. Interestingly, the second and third one showed the variation of the factors among the different intervals. For shallower bore, the correction factors were higher than the ones on the deeper bore. And another interesting thing was when the soil is stronger, it was more likely to estimate delta method to estimate the PMAS higher than the than the factored ones. So Roughly, I combined all of them in, so into one for those three methods, and it could come up something like this. This is just simple average, and then and then it, the overall trend did not change. It also showed a similar behavior. And this risk-based factor is something I have to work on further for the research. So let's say for the higher, and this requires the risk assessment for the consequence and likelihood so for the high risk environment can be the ones such as river crossing, railway crossing, highway crossing. And remember these values are only examples yet. And this high risk environment will require a lot of high cost for the remediation cost. And for the lower low risk environment, which is rural in undeveloped area and the remote area, which the remediation cost will be significantly lower. And probably maybe you don't even need much. So I was thinking it is more applicable to have higher value for the factor of safety compared to the one with the lower risk. So here's a final. That's how these components for each for the framework was, was thought for the concept. And I still have homework to fill up all the values for each boxes. And in order to complete the factor safety framework, 
I need information from industries such as key hydro fracture, depth of bore, and the soil information regarding the end value and the geological information with the bore log. Project costs, especially in terms of remediation, location of HTV so that I can figure out which type of environment it happened, and any other notable information which may be affecting the stability of the borehole and relating to the inadvertent return of the drilling mud as well. So I'd like to wrap up my presentation at this point. So for the newly developed SPT-based method allows the direct application of M value to estimate the P max. And depending on the soil type, different with the different drainage condition, either drained or undrained soil model can be selected. And compared to the undrained soil model, which represents the linear relationship between the normalized P max and the N value, drained soil model presented a nonlinear relationship. And compared to the P max estimated with the undrained soil model, P max estimated with the drained soil model was found much greater for the same N value. And through the validation, it was found the estimation of P max using the SDT based method was improved compared to the ones estimated by the other researchers without it. And a minimum factor of safety of at least two or higher is strongly recommended for the SPT based method. And by making comparison between the original depth method and the three commonly used factor depth methods, the first component of factor of safety framework could be proposed, but even this one has to be worked on with the actual failure pressure. And the second component of the framework, which is the risk-based, is only proposed conceptually yet. And I did some validation for the first, first component for the framework, which I used the three factor help methods, but and I could obtain the reasonable agreement for the validation, but still this has to be worked more since this method is not complete. And in the future, I would like to collect more information to complete the framework. And the lastly, I want to make comparison between the SPT based method and the Queens method for the soft clay soils, since this is gaining popularity in the industry. And this SPT based method is very rough estimator for the undrained soil. And also, I would like to make comparison with the numerical modeling for the improvement of the estimation as well. And here are the references for this presentation. And I would like to appreciate to CETT and NZERC for the support for this research and the study. And that's it for today's presentation. And thank you. And if you have any question, I am here available if I can answer them. So please feel free to ask any questions. And thank you for participating in my presentation today. All right. Well, thank you, Justin, for that great presentation. Uh, I'm just going to open up the floor. Does anyone have any questions for Justin at this time? I haven't seen any come through in the chat yet. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and ask a question then. So the SPT test is definitely one of the most commonly used tests during drilling programs. However, it's highly scrutinized for its accuracy and repeatability in the field. So did you consider the uncertainty surrounding the actual SPT test method? And if so, how did you consider it? Yes, definitely. SPT is not very reliable for a lot of the factors or the geotechnical parameters we are getting. But but this is the industry. They are not very like rigorous with the soil investigation. They are doing their bare minimum. So our actual goal is to push them to do more testing. But because for now, whatever we have available, we also have to create something to improve our estimation at the moment. So moving the entire industry is kind of like, like it's a big homework at the moment, but we can at least like make prediction more accurate because like it is likely to have almost all of the projects do the SPT based investigation and they will roughly estimate the geotechnical parameters, but the, I've seen the way they estimate is very unsystematic. They just based on like a linear interpretation for, from like those like uh, typical values and they don't really consider the soil types. So at this moment, this is just for 
assisting at the moment, but we're trying to move forward with like more advanced test methods. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. No one? Uh, I'll see if I can come. So with the, the two kind of paths you showed on your presentation of how they come to terms with choosing their parameters, so either going through the geotechnical engineer or just getting the borehole logs and making up their own numbers to get their DELF method or their, their Pmax values. Mm -hmm. um, so with with bypassing the geotechnical engineers altogether, isn't isn't there a chance that they're taking these n values as like essentially gospel numbers that they represent exactly what the soil is displaying and kind of missing the point of looking at the big picture? And if exactly. so, how do, you, how do you think you can move forward from this and trying to show the industry that you know it's important to actually consider not just the the number that pumps out from the end test, but also kind of the big picture of what you're seeing in the borehole. Well, that's related to the first question. So that's the whole thing. Like, if we can, if they don't rely on the end value only, but if they can actually recognize it's important, let's say for soft clay, we have to do something more advanced. We use vein shear and we use the, even CPT and we take a sample and we do the different testing. That will be much better estimation but like for now we have that's why we would like to keep convincing the the regulatory bodies and the consulting engineers this is important so we're trying to move on but this is kind of like the passing stage we're trying to like at least have something to estimate better because 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 of this hydrofracture actually it causes a lot of the municipalities not preferring the HDD method. Like for example, New Orleans, New Orleans district, they almost don't want any HDD going on like when there's like an embankment or something. So we would like to improve our estimation so at least we can prevent this event, not just like blindly going through with rough estimation. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just keep going. Um, I, I'm curious too. It, so in industry, is it more, does, does hydrofracking occur more often than not? So are we generally overly conservative with our designs or under conservative? And like, what would you say the percentage of projects that actually have hydrofracking problems is? Hydrofracking problem actually happens very often I see from the case studies. And uh, it's something it's hard to predict, but it's something we can still kind of control during the operation. I think that's the reason they're kind of careless sometimes because like, let's say when the drilling happens and then the frack is about to happen, then people kind of try to delay and try to regain. There's some drilling techniques they can use to regain the pressure, but Sometimes it's really difficult and it's inevitable they actually have a frack happen. But then that's the thing, it happens underground and people cannot see easily. So they have tendency to like kind of get away with it, but it's it's clearly happening often. So we we try to have some way to estimate it better so that that won't happen, especially under the river, if it happens then it will contaminate the water, but it, it's hard to tell if the scale is like not very large. So we we don't want to happen. And also worst thing is when that happens, then until the pressures begin, we cannot continue further for drilling. So that's another important point we have to figure out hydro fracture will likely to happen or it's not going to happen. Awesome. So I don't see any other questions, so I guess we'll wrap it up there. And thanks a lot for your presentation today, Justin. It was great.
Um, and next week, just so everyone's aware, we'll have Rock Science coming out to do kind of a presentation on their suite of products that they offer. So kind of geotechnical modeling and things like that. So everyone come out and everyone thank Justin again for his great presentation. Thank you for coming.